Thanks, Chair. Before I get into my substantive questions, I'm just curious, uh, in relation to another Justin Trudeau a scandal, the Arrive scam, uh, it was revealed that prior to a first committee attendance, the president of the CBSA, the deputy minister, was summoned to the prime minister's office, presumably for coaching. Have either of you, and Mr. Quinlan on screen, has anyone received coaching prior to your appearance today? Was anyone? Right. No? Mr. Quinlan? No, no one just answering, Mr. Chair, sorry, just to uh, answer uh, the, the question directly, the answer is no. Thank you. No one was required to attend the Prime Minister's office? No? Mr. Quinlan? The answer is uh, no, Mr. Chair. Did anyone get direction from the Minister, in your case, Minister Duclos? Uh, no direction, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now, I know there is a lot that has been written in our nationals with respect to the extravagant nature of this acquisition. There was a quote from Global Affairs, I appreciate, not attributable to anyone here, but I wish to read it out to the record. The residence currently used for the head of mission and council general in New York, this is the Park Avenue property, was purchased in 61, last refurbished in 82. The apartment does not meet new building codes nor global affairs standards. Now, the purchase uh, at um, West 57th is listed as follows. There is an elegant entry foyer with white Makuba stone floors. Is that a requirement for the Council General of Canada? Perhaps in answering that question, I've, I've sort of alluded to it before. You only hold real property to support... That, Ma'am, that's not my question. Right. Is, is it a requirement of Mr. Clark's uh, position as Council General in New York that he has white Makuba stone floors? Is that a requirement? That's not I'm just a, curious. It's not a charging board requirement. Okay. A stunning powder room finished in jewel onyx. Another requirement of that Council not, General? Uh, of the Treasury Board Secretariat? That would not be a okay. requirement in our policy. Custom smoke gray oak floors in a parquet pattern. Would that be a requirement, Mr. Clark? So I think all my answers to your questions will be, no. will be yeah. Yeah. The condo includes three bedrooms, a study, four and a half bedrooms including one, this is the master bathroom, clad in Italian white Venato marble and featuring a freestanding copper soaking tub handcrafted by William Holland and custom bronze fixtures by P.E. Guerin. Now again, I'll ask the same question that you can't answer, whether or not that's Mr. Clark's requirements or, or Council General's requirements. But you talk about this being an investment. Uh, low cost is not always the best value. There are starving Canadians who are relying on food banks who would love to have a real property investment in New York with these type of features. Do you see the disconnect between what the government is doing and the reality on the Canadian streets? You see that distinction? So I totally appreciate your okay. comments. And I go for I go further. The, the amenities include a 25 meter two lane swimming pool with private cabanas, a separate sauna and treatment rooms, a fitness center, a residence lounge, and access to a paddle court, a golf simulator. I'd love to have a golf simulator sitting in my basement. But I'm not Justin Trudeau's friends. So friends of Justin Trudeau get to explore these wonderful wealthy amenities while the rest of us Canadians have to struggle. Do you see the problem that the government of Canada has with respect to this purchase? The optics are very, very poor. And I know you talk about a threshold of up to $10 million, but you didn't have to buy right at the foot of Central Park. Manhattan is a big island. 
Why does the why does the council general require that proximity to Central Park? Why does he have to have all of these luxury amenities? Well, the rest of us suffer in this country. Why? So I think a good response to, to get to your to response to your question, and I think it's alluded to in the package that was submitted to this committee, is the mission requirements are established by Global Affairs under their property management manual. So I think when Global Affairs officials are here, they should be able to walk through those how they set out those requirements for an official residence. Because Canadians deserve an answer. I Thank you very much. You. Um, Mr. Baines, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. Um, my question are directed, uh, my initial questions here are directed to uh, members of the PSPC, if you could help me um, understand a little bit more. The Treasury Board's transaction approval limits and conditions for the acquisition or disposition of real property says uh, GAC may dispose of properties outside Canada up to a transaction limit of uh, $25 million. Is PSPC required to appraise properties that are being disposed under the transaction limit? So uh, PSPC is responsible for providing the appraisal for the acquisition and the disposal. Uh, for more questions with regards to the actual policy, um, I defer to my colleague from Treasury Board Secretary. So PSPC is required to appraise properties that are being disposed under the transaction limit, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes, PSPC follows Treasury Board Secretary's policy, uh, and when disposal services are required, we provide those to custodians, in this case, Global Affairs Canada. So in the event that the pro previous property is being disposed of, you would you would be required to appraise that, provide appraisal for that? Following Treasury Board Secretariat uh, policy, that's okay. correct. Um, and when other uh, departments purchase properties, again, PSPC is involved in the cost-benefit analysis also? Strictly following Treasury Board Secretariat's policy with regards to the appraisal. And again, uh, uh, very and strictly limited to the appraisal. Okay, and the and business then, decisions. The business sure. decisions. I apologize, Mr. Chair. I, I interrupted the member, so I will uh, stop my answer. Wait for the next question. No, you, you can continue. You were you were about to finish your statement. Yes. So the business decisions belong to the custodial departments. Okay, and then the directive on the manage, uh, management of real property states that departments must undertake a full life cycle analysis, again, before acquiring a real property asset, seeking the best value. And, and given that the property purchase cost $9 million and the old residence is being sold for over $13 million, would you say that it appears as good value that's being attained? I believe that the specific question, Mr. Chair, should be addressed to Global Affairs Canada. Uh, with the question, the, uh, the part of the question that pertains to the policy, I will defer to my colleague from Treasury Board Secretariat. So, sure. it, yeah, you. in response yeah. to the question, the expectation would be that Global Affairs took a life cycle cost analysis of maintaining the existing and updating it, acquiring the new one through either a lease or through a purchase. As part of that life cycle uh, analysis, they would be looking at not just the cost of acquisition, but the ongoing operating costs and the potential disposition costs. So the expectation would be that GAC in its optionals, options analysis looked at that and that helped uh, inform the decision that they took. So, you know, in essence, all levels of government buy and sell properties. This is something that is done, and, and there's a level of maintenance that's required. You know, we see, um, you know, properties that may need, um, you know, may need to be up to standard, up to code. Like, what are some of those requirements? Maybe, you know, accessibility. Um, are there... 
Right. Were there issues in in this uh, case with, with respect? I, I understand there was some discussion around uh, the uh, previous um, uh, residents being not up to code. If you can maybe talk a little bit about that, the standards and the code of uh, what's required in in the properties that are being purchased. What do they need? What are what what things should they have, uh, whether it's uh, accessibility to people with disabilities or things of that nature? I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll start the answer to that question. So consistent with Treasury Board policy, you would want to make sure that um, you, one, acquire and hold and maintain real property only to support a programmatic need of a department. So the requirements around the need for an official residents and what those specifications look like would be set by global affairs. They have that authority pursuant to the departmental legislation, so that's the first. And then there are requirements around ensuring that the real property supports broader government priorities. That would include greening. That would include accessibility. So those factors should come into play in that business case that global affairs would have undertaken to support the transaction. Is a feasibility study mandatory for the repair, renovation, or purchase of a diplomatic or official residence pursuant to Government of Canada policies? Now you're testing me, but I would say if you're making a renovation, you would undertake an analysis like it would be a project, so you would do... Uh, the normal pre-project definition options analysis before you would get into okay. the actual implementation. So in relation to the existing property owned by the Government of Canada at 550 Park Avenue before the decision was made to purchase West 57th, was a, feasi was a feasibility study prepared in relation to that transaction? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question that would be something that GAC officials would be able to answer what they looked at in terms of the renovation okay. uh, cost. Can anyone on this panel uh, weigh in on that uh, answer? Anybody? No? Okay. So in your opinion uh, Ms. Tatterstall would it be GAC who's responsible for the creation of a feasibility study if one was done pursuant to policy? So yes, as the real property custodian, they would be responsible for uh, looking at any sort of options analysis before <coughs> undertaking a renovation. Thank you. I know that there is a talking point that the purchase of the new property is smaller, it was more economical for the taxpayer, but very, very light in terms of details. I know the current property, the new property, is just under 3,600 square feet. What was the square footage of the property on Park Avenue? Anyone have an answer to that? I don't know. Um, so, thank you, Mr. We, Chair, we, for this. Oh, thank sorry. you. Sorry, Mark. I, I'll you, defer to uh, my colleague, uh, Director General. Uh, go ahead, Linda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the speaker for the question. Um, <laughs> the uh, the subject pro uh, property at five 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 uh, five fifty Park Avenue was three thousand eight hundred and seventy three square meters. Three thousand eight hundred and seventy three. So the new property is around two hundred square feet or square meters less. Would that be your understanding? Correct. Okay. That is a very interesting answer because according to GAC, there is um, a, a, an impression they're giving Canadians that this new move represented a saving opportunity of more than $2 million for Canadian taxpayers, that it would also reduce ongoing maintenance costs and property taxes and support future program needs. The new property has a carrying cost per year of $235,896 
U.S., which is probably just under $400,000 Canadian per year. Specifically, taxes, $10,000 U.S. per month. Monthly common charges, uh, just under $9,600 U.S. dollars per month. Does anyone have any information with respect to the taxes and carrying costs on Park Avenue? Anyone? No, I don't have access to those. I don't think PSPC would either, but I would expect that when they did their life cycle cost analysis, that the, the operating costs of both properties would have been taken into consideration. The annual cost for this new property is more, and we just heard one of our colleagues from Fredericton, New Brunswick, is more than the actual purchase price of properties in her hometown. Do you not think this is a real problem with the government of Canada? that the taxpayers, we are paying out over $400,000 Canadian per year just to allow Justin Trudeau's buddy to live in luxury in Manhattan? Is that acceptable to you as a taxpayer? Not only are you civil servants, you're taxpayers. Is that acceptable to you? So again, what I would say is that the official residence is acquired to support a mission in New York. So the requirements for that would be established by GAC pursuant to their legislation. So they acquire that to achieve their mission results in New York. So um, I don't have anything further than I can Sky's the limit, that. I guess, so long as it meets the mission's needs. That's, no. that's what I'm hearing as a taxpayer. No. So long as it meets the mission needs, it is the cost be damned. So consistent with Treasury Board policy, it is a balance, best value is a balance between the real property meeting the operational requirements with the cost of the acquisition and the maintenance over the life cycle of the asset. Thank you.